Today, swearing has become an almost meaningless phrase used in common speech to add a bit of intensity to whatever is being said. But why is swearing now used to refer to cursing or using insulting or foul language? How is swearing or oath-taking done in ancient times? And what did all of it really mean? What really is swearing? The act of swearing or oath-taking may well be one of the oldest mechanisms of law and social organization that actually extended beyond the family unit. Its purpose is to ensure that the words spoken, the commitments made by one or more peoples will be faithfully upheld. In ancient times it formed the basis of treaties between nations, the rule of kings or chieftains, between people trading goods, but also such things like laws ensuring true speech or any important matter where a threatening force was needed to ensure the words and deeds of a person were as declared. Swearing was not thought something to do lightly, for the force of a swear or oath was dangerous to the one who spoke it and also dangerous to one it spoke against. But how? What makes the use of a swear any more forceful? The etymology of the English word swear comes from Proto-Indo-European, swear meaning to speak loudly, or swear. Speaking loudly is likely related to making a public declaration, but not necessarily always a public declaration but perhaps simply the elevated voice gives the meaning that one is trying to stress the importance of what they are saying. Implicit in the idea of invoking an oath is that there is some other power, a god, that is directly being called upon to witness the oath and to inflict punishment, often death, upon the violation of it. And the son of Atreus lifted up his hands in prayer. Father Zeus, he cried, that rulest in Ida, most glorious in power. O thou, O son, that seest and givest ear to all things, earth and rivers, and ye who in the realms below chastise the soul of him that has broken his oath, witness these rites and guard them, that they be not in vain. Zeus, most great and glorious, and ye other everlasting gods, grant that the brains of them who shall first sin against their oath, of them and their children, may be shed upon the ground, even as this wine, and let their wives become the slaves of strangers. These are the words of Agamemnon, given before the peoples of Troy and the host of the Argi. What gives the oath force is that the one who speaks it is invoking the gods, the cosmos itself even, to seek retribution against if they violate their words or speak falsely. The speaking of it carries weight in itself, but it was in archaic times usually accompanied with a particular ritual. It is a form of self-curse and in Homeric Greek sources, this is made explicit by comparing the sacrificed animals or the libation to the deaths of those swearing should they violate the oath. Now, unfortunately, the etymology of oath is not particularly clear. It would appear to have had the same meaning as early as Proto-Indo-European times and it doesn't help us much in getting a grip on what it might have actually originally meant. Yet it is shared only between Celtic and Germanic languages. However, Celtic does have another word for oath, lugge, in Old Irish meaning oath or swear, and thu in Welsh, 
which seems to be the basis for the name of the god, Lu. A common saying in old Irish tales, especially those from the Ulster cycle, is, I swear by the god my people swear by. Yet this formula is done without saying the word luge. Instead, the verb tongith is used, taken to mean swear, but which comes from the Proto-Indo-European word teg, meaning to touch. Thus, likely in origin at least, part of the formula for making the oath required the touching of something, which we will look into shortly. It is possible that the word luge was avoided for fear of its power. In one version of the birth tale of Cúhollán, the child that was originally born to another and which Djechtana was caring for died. After mourning, she returned to her house and then she swore for a drink in exasperation, using a word phrase that included luga, meaning oath or swear. And it was then that the spirit of Lug came to her, invoked perhaps by her words, which summoned the god by his own name, and he impregnated her with his spirit through the medium of a drink that she swore for. This tale, as well as other elements, strongly suggests that not only was Lug a god who observed oaths, but that his name developed from the word for oath. In Proto-Indo-European, this was Logium. The oath in most Indo-European traditions, and most others worldwide, was done beneath the sky, and most often in the light of day, very often invoking as primary guardian of that oath the sky god who witnesses and most importantly enforces it through divine power. The temple of the Roman god Dius Fidius, a god of oaths and contracts, was open to the sky. In Old Gaelic law it is said that valid oaths can only be made after sunrise and before sunset, connecting the oath and the power to properly bind the oath to daylight. In Greek, the word for oath and swear is related to a word meaning fence, implying containment. Now while often the formula from ancient Greek is translated into English as I swear by Zeus, this isn't a direct translation. More directly, it says, I swear, Zeus. Like with Lug in Irish myth, Zeus's name is directly used to make the oath. Pausanias reports that Zeus was terrifying to behold, holding a lightning bolt in each hand, ready to strike down anyone who violated their oaths. However, the oath often called on various elements, and perhaps from the very earliest times, predating even Proto-Indo-European, it was not a specific god which was invoked, but the raw forms of nature. Thus in Homer we see Zeus called upon primarily, but alongside earth and sun, the gods themselves are pictured making oaths. Zeus made the goddess Styx, a river, the great oath of the gods. Hesiod says, For whoever of the deathless gods that holds the peaks of snowy Olympus pours a libation of her water is forsworn, lies breathless until a full year is completed, and never comes to taste the ambrosia and nectar, but lies spiritless and voiceless on a strewn bed, and a heavy trance overshadows him. But when he has spent a long year in his sickness, another penance and a harder follows after the first. For nine years he is cut off from the eternal gods and never joins their councils or their feasts. Nine full years. But in the tenth year he comes again to join the assemblies of the deathless gods who live in the house of Olympus. Such an oath, then did the gods appoint the eternal and primeval water of Styx to be, and it spouts through a rugged place. Sky, Uranus, and Gay, Earth, are very frequently asked to observe the oath, as is the sun who sees and hears all. 
In Celtic tradition, the sun and moon were often called upon as guarantors of oath, but a more extensive list was offered sun and moon, sky and earth, wind and stars, fire and water. Conhovar, the legendary king of Ulster, said, I swear by the sea before them, the sky above them, the earth beneath them, that I shall restore every cow to its buyer and every woman and boy to their own homes after victory in battle. These oaths were believed to hold real power, and Christian historical annals record several instances of the power of these violated oaths turning against the ones who made them. The Annals of Ulster records that the sun and wind killed a king who betrayed his oath, for he had sworn upon them. Though a detailed description does not exist about the exact ritual for making an oath in ancient Ireland, one most certainly did exist and it likely involved touching, as the verb tongueth suggests. But touching what? Possibly weapons or other hallowed artifacts. The word min in Old Irish refers to a hallowed artifact upon which oaths were sworn. It is the name of one of the nine guardians of Lug, and it also can refer to like a crown or a diadem, but it really could be a wide variety of objects. Oaths were often made by weapons, and this comes up also in Irish annals, where monks record the swearing of oaths upon weapons by Norse and likewise by Gaels. This practice is explained by saying that the weapons were thought to possess a spirit which could turn upon the wielder if it knew the person had violated their oath. This same belief is recorded in Byzantine records as having been believed by the Rus, who swore oaths upon their weapons and explained that the weapons would turn against the oath breakers. This belief implies that there was a spirit within the weapon. Even what we consider to be non-living things could react and take justice against a wrongdoer. In Gaelic myth, the god Ogma was said to have spoken with a sword of the Fomoyran king Tethra, which related all of its deeds and the text explains that in this time, spirits were thought to inhabit weapons and could be communicated with. This may well be the origin for naming weapons. It's been speculated that this belief might arise from the magical process involved in forging the object through fire, and sometimes the use of charcoal and bone charcoal in the process. Remnants of living things which might impart their spirit into the object through the forging. Smiths were one of the three classes of people that St. Patrick's prayer sought protection from, the others being druids and witches, so they were certainly believed to hold great magical powers. Other objects were also detailed as having such powers. Moran, the great mythical lawgiver, was said to have a collar which was worn around the neck. In all likelihood this collar was a torque, and it was said that if a person wearing it told a lie, the collar would constrict, eventually strangling them to death, and a version of this tale even survives in late Irish folklore, where a hero gives a lying queen such a collar to wear around her neck before asking her several questions in which she must reveal that she betrayed the king and ends up strangled to death by it. Might this have been the reason that the torque was a symbol of Celtic nobility, not only a piece of jewelry, but a symbol of truth, that if they lied against it, it would turn against them, strangling the dishonest wearer. In Norse tradition, rings were sometimes used in oaths. There is evidence that this Norse practice took place in Dublin, where a ring of Thor was kept. And Thor very likely refers to Thor, who was also said to have had a sacred grove somewhere in the area, which was cut down by Brian Baru's forces when they retook the area. 
An important part of swearing an oath in various cultures was touching an object, and we saw the word form related to this in Old Gaelic. When a blade or other object was sworn upon, it had to be held by the one swearing. In Norse sources, an oath ritual is described where a boar is slain, and men swear upon the boar touching it while doing so, and that this is related likely to the god Freyr. In the Iliad, when the Trojans and Achaeans swear an oath, some of the wool is cut from the sheep to be sacrificed and passed around to hold. When Agamemnon makes an oath to Achilles, he likewise cuts some of the hair from the boar and holds it in his hand. Those swearing the oath must in some way directly contact with the sacrificed victim, either with its blood, its hair, or some other item which is being sworn upon. In an Athenian oath related to murder trials, the practice was to stand upon the guts of the sacrificed victim to make the oath. To forswear is to swear falsely, and this can be done intentionally, whether lying while swearing or accidentally. Someone might swear to accomplish a task and yet fail to do so. This failure is to be forsworn, but the violation is a violation nonetheless, whether intentional or otherwise. Interesting is that the word swear is also contained in the word answer, answer, from Old English answaru, meaning likely to give a sworn statement in reply to a charge. But how did this swearing become such a bad thing? Christianity is not theologically favorable to the practice. In the Bible, there are several quotations where the act of swearing is denounced. In one case, by Jesus himself, who says, Swear not at all. This may be because of the risk of violating such an oath, and the expectation that God would then act to give justice, which doesn't always happen. It also is explained that a Christian should always strive to act according to his or her word, and swearing implies that one only acts according to their word when compelled by a threat of punishment by God. Whatever the case, early Christians refused to swear, sometimes even becoming martyrs over it. Eventually, however, the prohibition of swearing collapsed and was grudgingly embraced by the church under their own control and following their own forms. But there remained an idea that swearing was something generally not to be engaged in. Further, swearing is implicitly a type of curse in that it implies the invocation of a negative consequence upon someone and a power beyond the swearer that would manifest this. So swearing against someone is also to curse them, and it's also invoking some sort of supernatural power. Thus, in modern Gaelic, lug means to swear or curse, but lug means to make an oath. Anyhow, I hope you found this interesting, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. Thanks to all of my great supporters out there, and as always, stand tall.